Hey, I'm glad you decided to join us today. Um, you know, the longer this thing goes on, you know, I, I find myself just dressing down and, and uh, you know, at least I got out of my pajamas today. And, and um, 
But hey, I'm glad you're, you're, you're with us. We are living in a world that is just completely under pressure right now, and the pressure just seems to be increasing. We're going to talk about that today. Um, as we get going, I want to introduce you to some friends of mine first, though. Listen to this. My name is Bill Trope, and I'm the pastor of Bridgeview Church in Valley Center, California. These are my friends, Craig and Sarah Marshall. And now, Craig and Sarah, we've known each other for longer than we'd like Too to long. admit. It's in, it, how, how are we even still alive? Yeah, I mean, right? how is that possible? And, and, and uh, we, we know each other in our childbearing years and, and beyond, right? And, and, uh, um, and here we are. And, and, uh, and Craig, you grew up in Lemon Grove and, and went to San Diego State. You ended up marrying a Minnesota girl, okay? Mm -hmm. I mean, how did that happen? Yeah, in, in Idaho of all places. But we actually met in Iowa on a summer project with what used to be known as Campus Crusade, now known as Crew, where we were meeting international students during the uh, on weekends and nighttime, and we worked during the day, and that's where we met. And as they say, the rest is history. Yeah. I mean, we <laughs> both had four kids, and and uh, and and uh, you, you guys now have two grown young men, you know, son as sons, massive guys that are that are they're living in Southern California. They're into their careers and and. And uh, I hope you saw them yesterday at, we did. at Mother's Day. We did. And, and, uh, um, and then, of course, you have your son in Arizona, who's now in Arizona, a, a, a United States Marine officer, and, mm -hmm. and, and his family, and then, and then uh, your daughter's family up in Alaska. And, and between them, they've got three grandkids. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, and you guys are scattered all over. But you guys are used to being scattered, yeah. right? And, and uh, um, now you, you, your kids, were three of three of the four were actually born in Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. and and and, uh, and and they grew up kind of trans most of the time over there, and then but also sometimes mm -hmm. here in the United States. Why did why did that happen? Well, when we were um, as we grew as Christians, you know, in college and beyond that, we were we really um, God's word really helped us. You know, how do you grow as a Christian if you don't engage with God's word and we found out that uh, there's some groups in the world, language groups, that don't have God's word. And um, we just wanted to be a part of helping that. And God just really put that on our hearts to be a part. And so, yeah, we have spent a long time um, as a part of a, t a big team translating God's word um, out in Asia. And uh, it's been amazing, a great journey. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you guys have really, I mean, truthfully spent your life energies, your... your um, your abilities, and and, and, uh, and you went through a lot of training, mm -hmm. and you have gifts that give you the ability to do this, but you've, you've brought God's Word to a group of people who had it but before, but not in their mother tongue, not not in the, the language that they were raised in and, and the, the language that they're most familiar with, and, and, and th that group of people now has that, mm -hmm. and, and that's your enduring legacy in, in their lives, and, and you finished your New Testament um, uh, what, four years ago, right. and and um, and I know you're working on on still some portions. Why don't you explain that, and I'll, and also explain what's happening with that translation now? Mm -hmm. You know, we just finished up this last November. We finished up Genesis and 450 verses in Psalms, and that's the last that we will do with that language for now. That's the language the people in the group. They feel that's they're good with that for now. And the three, two men and one, one woman that we've been working with the longest, they are transitioning to now help in three other new languages getting translations going. So they're going to be doing what we did so many years ago. Now it's in their hands and we're coaching them. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. That is really great. What a, what a, a great thing to, to accomplish. That's, that's incredible. And, um, um, I have one last question for you, um, uh, Craig. As you well know, the the state fish of, of the state of California is the Garibaldi fish. Um, Lovely fish. It, it's, it's actually a crime to um, molest them, uh, do, do, any, that. do any, you know, <laughs> that type of thing. And, and for our viewers, uh, a, a Garibaldi is kind of like an overgrown, ocean-going uh, goldfish, very similar to the ones you used to flush down the toilet when you were little kids. And well, Craig, I know that you were attacked by a Garibaldi at one point, and because you were committing that crime of molestation, <laughs> and um, and and my my memory is is that you had a gas-powered spear gun, and 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 so you had a powerful weapon on you, and yet somehow it was the Garibaldi that drew blood. Um, 
How did that happen, Craig? You know, it, it was actually a piranha masquerading as a cure yeah, ball. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it took a pound of flesh, you yeah. know. Yeah, the yeah. story keeps growing as we get older, Bill. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. If it wasn't for this COVID-19 thing, I think you would have been coming across at me. You know, <laughs> but, um, but God bless you guys. I mean, it, it's amazing what you've done with your lives and, and, and so much respect what you've done and, 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 and admire the, the, uh, the, not only the dedication that you, you've had over all these years, but also um, it, it's awe-inspiring to know that you're as as the generations go forward with this people group now, they have God's word in their language, um, and, and who knows what, what he's going to do with that. And so thank you for doing that. Thank you for, on, on behalf of the church, thank you for being those people and doing that. Yeah, it's been our, yeah, it's been awesome for us, and we're so thankful to Richview, who's been behind us now more than 20 years, in praying and in giving, helping to make this all happen. Well, the blessing it. goes both ways. It definitely yeah. does. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, I knew Craig would get worked up about that last question, and that's well, actually, that's why I asked it. And and uh, you know, as, after we shut the cameras off, he actually physically attacked me. He didn't want to do that because of the COVID physical distancing thing and stuff. And all I did was cough in his face though, and it got got him right off of me. It was no big deal. But I, I was with Craig that day out at the Catalina Isthmus. Um, when he picked that fight with that Garibaldi fish, which is a crime in the state of California. And the truth is that Garibaldi bit him on this little bit of exposed skin between his mask and his wetsuit hood. And, 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 and yes, there really was blood. But diving that day out there on the Catalina Islands was magical. We were like 60 feet down in a kelp forest. It was just absolutely spectacular. The water was crystal clear. And, and I, am a, I was a really inexperienced diver, and, and I'm just sucking that air down, and bubbles are going everywhere, and I suck my tank dry and, and almost nothing flat. Came up then, you know, I, I knew I was supposed to come up kind of slow, but I came up a little too fast, apparently, that day, because when I got up, I could feel a faint taste of blood in my, in my, in my throat and in my mouth. And, the reason for the blood has to do with the, the physics and the physiology of, the pre of pressure on the human body. Water is not compressible, but gases are compressible. So at depth, water feels exactly the same. And the reason for that is it is exactly the same. It doesn't get compressed. You just might be not as much light as you're normally used to, but the gases, we need to stay alive are affected by the cumulative weight of all that water. Gases are compressible, and the pressure of the weight of the water above me that day compressed the gases in my lungs and in my bloodstream. A 33-foot column of water has the same weight as, a 33, as, as, as the atmosphere does at sea level, the effects it has on your body. It just takes 33 feet of water, it takes miles of atmosphere to impose those pressures. And the pressure exerted by that column of water compresses the gases inside of our bodies. Like if I, for instance, if I took a, a, a deep breath and dove down to 33 feet, my lungs would be full at the top, but only half full at 33 feet. To put it in reverse, if you took a big breath of air out of a tank and, and just held your breath and went to the surface, you'd explode. Well, you wouldn't really explode, but something would have to give. And that day off Catalina, something did give inside of me. Now, I was very fortunate, you know, because we were down almost, six, almost two atmospheres, 66 feet. If I'd come up a little bit faster than I did, I could have had a serious illness. People actually can die from these things. And I tell you this to make a point, pressure is dangerous. Pressure it can be very dangerous. And during this COVID-19 spring that we're having now, the whole world is being squeezed under an immense burden. There's the pressure, this immense pressure to keep people healthy, right? The burden of protecting the vulnerable, of comforting those who are living in fear right now is something we need to do. This is a new kind of virus and we have to figure out how to deal with it and to slow the spread down. And then there, so there's that pressure, and then there's the pressure to get people back to work, right? We have to get 
We have to figure that one out, you know, and, and there are real and present dangers if we don't do that. Things can't stay locked down forever. So we have to figure out how to competently and compassionately balance these competing pressures, these competing priorities. Then you add to that the burden of all the, all the personal stuff that goes on in our lives. Some are unemployed and are facing a desperate situation. Others, because of the jobs they're in, they're working all this overtime right now and they're, they're wiped out. Some are simply bored and, and desperately wanting to get out of the cabin and reduce, get rid of that cabin fever. Others are working really harder than ever in jobs that expose them to the risk of bringing this disease back home to their families. Some are genuinely fearful. You know, what they see is a public health crisis. Others are very angry. Some see it as a political power play. Some are mourning the loss of loved ones during this time and, 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 they're, and they're dying from just the normal things that we die of, from heart disease and cancers and accidents and things like this. And they're dealing with the, the, the burden of trying to memorialize their loved ones in this time when we can't gather in large crowds. And, 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 in, and in the midst of all this, babies are still being born. Um, there are, there are, people are figuring out how to celebrate weddings and, and, and graduations and other really important life passages. And, and all of this creates pressures on us. And now, people, many people went into this season that we're in right now, this pressure-filled season, believing that we could create our own co outcomes, that we're the ones that are the powerful ones, that we could engineer endless prosperity, that we could protect and defend ourselves from any external threat, that we could craft a better society, that we could do it, that we had the power to do that. But the coronavirus reminds us that actually at the end of the day, we're not in control. That's the truth about us. That's the truth of our situation. Dave Matthews is a, has a song, a song called Dive In, and the lyrics talk about how our efforts to figure out things and to fix the problems of the world often don't work no matter how hard we try. And he concludes that though we would like to believe we are, we are not in control. Though we would love to believe that we were. The pressures we're, experienced, we're experiencing right now are caused by huge problems that do not have easy solutions. And these kinds of pressures force us to face the truth that we are not in control, though we would love to believe that we are. Matthew's lyrics include this prayer. Tell me everything will be okay if I just stay on my knees and keep praying, believing in something. Tell me everything is all taken care of by those qualified to take care of it all. Matthew says, tell me everything will be okay. I just stay on my knees and keep praying, believing in something. Today I want to remind you of something to believe. You can count on this. Believe this. We are not in control, but someone is in control. Believe it. And to a world that's looking to human, imperfect human beings and saying, tell me everything is all taken care of by those who are qualified to take care of it all, the one that is ultimately in control says to us, stay on your knees, keep praying, and believe this. In me, everything is all taken care of. I am the one who is qualified to take care of it all. I can relieve the pressures you're facing. Believe it. My friends, Craig and Sarah Marshall, have spent their lives getting God's word into the hands of a group of people whose names you've never heard of and whose names you would have probably have a hard time pronouncing. And they've done this for these people so that they can know the God who is qualified to take care of it all. The God who can take care of you, the God who can take care of me, the God who hears the God who speaks, the one who says, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. The one who says, come to me, all you who are burdened and weary. 
I will give rest to your soul. The one who says, don't be anxious. Don't be all tied up in knots with worry. Instead, bring your stuff to me. Bring it to me and I will give you peace. I can do that. Part of what gets a diver to depth is something called a weight belt. It's a belt you put on and you add weights to it. And the right amount of weight gives a diver neutral buoyancy in the water. But if you put on too much weight, you will tend to drift downward and, and to dangerous depths where the pressures are just simply too much. And, 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 and think with me for a second, if you would. What is it that's burdening you? What weight are you carrying that's dragging you down to those dangerous depths? And, and, and we can take off some of those weights. And the way you do it is by casting those cares, those burdens, back onto him with the knowledge that he does care for you and he is able to meet your need. The way you do that is you, you come to him. You come to him in prayer. And you bring your burdens, th that stuff that's making you weary, understanding that he will lift you back up and, and give rest to your, to your mind and to your soul. And, 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 and by releasing your worries and, and, and your anxieties and, and, and giving them over to Him, He has the ability to enter into your life and in spite of your circumstances, bring peace into your life again. Pressure is really, really dangerous. And if a diver has been under the pressure of deep water, especially for a very long time, they have to return to the surface. Actually, it takes time to do that. You have to do it very slowly. And here's why. One of the gases that we breathe is this gas called nitrogen. And, and under pressure, that nitrogen compresses and a diver that, 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 that it gets into the fluids and the tissues of the diver's body in a, in a compressed kind of way. And if a diver doesn't take time to come up and to allow those, that, that nitrogen to, to decompress, it, the results can be absolutely devastating. You can end up with a condition called the bends, where nitrogen bubbles expand and, and they, get in, they can get inside of your, your brain, your lungs, and your spine and create real damage. And the only way to overcome this is to spend the time to come back up slowly so that, that nitrogen can dissolve back into your bloodstream. To save lives, the U.S. Navy has developed dive tables or decompression tables. And these tables help divers know how long they need to take to decompress. And it depends on two factors. It depends on, first of all, the depth or the pressure at which they've been operating. And then secondly, the amount of time that they spent at that depth. According to these tables, a diver can operate pretty much indefinitely at 20 to 30 feet of water. If a diver goes down to the pressures of 130 feet of water, they can only spend 10 minutes down there without having to go through a long, lengthy decompression um, routine on the way back up. It takes a long time to do this. And the pressure is the more pressure you're under and the longer you're exposed to that pressure, the more time is needed to decompress. A diver, for instance, working at 900 feet for six hours must decompress for nine days. Now the question I want to ask you is this. Think about this. At what depth have you been operating and for how long? How much pressure have you been under and how long have you been under that pressure? What would the charts recommend? What, how long do you need to take to decompress? And what are you going to do about it? How much burdensome weight, you know? Do you need to remove from your belt and, 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 and cast off? Think for a second, what do you need to cast off? What are the concerns that you have? What are the things that you need to cast off and to this God who cares for you? What is it that you need to unburden yourself from? This one who wants to give rest to your soul. What are your anxious things there. What are the anxious things going on in your life? What is it that's weighing you down with worry? And, and, and if we bring our stuff to him, the stuff that's too much for us, believe this, 
it's not too much for him. He's able to take that and in spite of your circumstances, give you peace. Would you lower your heads? And, and I'd like to invite you to, to pray. Lord, in the midst of all that's going on in my life, give me relief from the pressures. and Help me to enter into a regular rhythm of decompression. Help me shed that which weighs me down. Help me to do that every day, to steal away a few moments at least to unburden myself from the pressures that I'm in, to reconnect with you, the God who cares, the God who brings life and peace, and even in the midst of a crazy life. And Lord, teach me how to get a day off every week, to decompress, and to know that it's not a waste of time but an investment that will pay great dividends. Teach me how to develop a rhythm, a cadence that works. Teach me to retreat so that I can regain perspective on my life, that I can learn to be content in whatever circumstances come my way because you are the giver of contentment. You are the God of peace. And I pray that you would be my companion and my protector. Amen. Stop working, you never stop, you never stop working. 
Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop, you never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop